Well, in the time-honored um, tradition, of we can never finish if we don't get started. I'm uh, happy to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar tonight. We have an exciting webinar on improving the care of gastric cancer patients, uh, the status and strategies for today and tomorrow. And this is part of our ongoing series uh, focused on patient-centric surgery in the 21st century, improving cancer care delivered through minimally invasive surgery involving the different organ systems. Um, and this is done in conjunction between SAGES, uh, SSO, uh, SSAT, and the American Cancer Society uh, for the gastric cancer. We're excited to have a uh, all-star cast, as I said, and our focus is, is really how we can do better by our cancer patients with less invasive surgery. And uh, to that end, for gastric cancer, it's my honor and pleasure to turn things over to uh, my co-program chair, Vivian Strong, who really needs no introduction, but she's the Iris Canner Chair of Surgery at Sloan Kettering. Uh, she's a full professor and associate dean at uh, Cornell Medical College. And uh, she, as you know, is a world expert on uh, minimally invasive gastric cancer and is going to uh, take us through today. Vivian? Thank you very much, John. And once again, I would like to welcome all of you who are joining our special webinar this evening, focusing on improving the care of gastric cancer patients. Um, as a surgeon at, at Sloan Kettering, my special focus, both clinically and research-wise, is gastric cancer. So that really makes it a distinct pleasure to host this joint webinar along with our co-sponsoring societies that, that John mentioned. Um, I'll be moderating the session along with my co-hosts, John Marks, and also Dr. Naru Ikoma, who you see on the screen here. Um, he is an assistant professor of surgery at MD Anderson Cancer Center and um, has expertise in gastric cancer and MIS approaches. So uh, the three of us will be, will be moderating. Uh, as John already mentioned, we have an all-star lineup uh, of hand-selected speakers for you, and our plan is to have each of them go through their talks. We'll save questions until the end, where we're hoping to have enough time to do a nice open panel discussion, and then we'll try to answer as many questions as we can uh, from the chat and uh, by email as well. So with that, let me have John introduce our first speaker and get things started. Great. So our first speaker we're excited to have and honored to have uh, Dr. Bill Kantz, who comes to us as the academic, uh, the chief medical and scientific officer for the American Cancer Society. And he's going to be speaking to us about uh, screening as the ultimate in minimally invasive surgery and uh, how this fits into uh, MIS gastric cancer. So Bill, take it away. All right. Be right there. Where? All righty. Slides view. So thanks very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, this American Cancer Society is pleased to be uh, supporting these efforts. It's a great link between our efforts and prevention, early detection, and minimally invasive surgery on, on this end. So I'll talk about prevention and screening, sort of a broad talk about uh, some of the aspects of prevention and screening current status, and uh, then talk about opportunities and, and as it applies to uh, gastric cancer, in particular minimally invasive approaches. So my disclosures are shown, the personal one is irrelevant. The American Cancer Society does uh, have a scientific collaboration with GRAIL and the early detection its space, and I will be mentioning GRAIL this evening. So I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 in cancer and how it's affected broadly uh, screening and subsequent cancer mortality. And from a prevention standpoint, I'll talk about tobacco and obesity, both of which are related to gastric cancer. I'll talk about the, some of the changing demographics. And I'm gonna introduce a concept of prevent, intercept, and cure as the evolving early detection tests 
link up with minimally invasive surgery. So first we can celebrate progress with uh, cancer mortality has declined in recent decades. There's been a lot of progress in screening, in treatment, research, and the public has generally adapted the screening uh, services. So over the years, we have seen a drop in the cancer death rate for both males and females. It peaked in the early 90s, and you can see this consistent decline in fact, for the last two years uh, in the United States, we've had the steepest one-year declines two years in a row. So if you had taken the death rate at the, at the middle part uh, uh, with its peak, you'll see that uh, we've saved about oh, 3 million lives by this reduction in the cancer mortality rate. So a lot of progress has come here uh, over the last 30 years. Then of course came COVID and COVID has threatened this progress for a number of different uh, reasons. It's, it, it has, it's like a perfect storm that has come together that would have a negative impact on cancer mortality uh, that reduced access to care. People have been afraid to go to the doctor, afraid to get their procedures. Healthcare resources have been reallocated to COVID there's been a lot of unemployment, loss of insurance, which impacts uh, whether you'll get screened or not. And this has caused delayed routine care, lack of follow-up of symptoms, later stage diagnoses. <clears throat> and we're seeing anecdotal reports of that uh, emerging um, every, every week. And the, also the possibility of delayed or modified treatment, which uh, all of these together we were in the risk of increasing cancer mortality and reversing those gains that we've made over the last 30 years. So what's happened? So we had about a 90% decline in screening related procedures over the last year and about 22 million screenings were disrupted. Now, this is a lot of modeling to predict how many people are involved, but early estimates predicted that about 80,000 delayed diagnoses were, were, were missed or were out there who need to be screened and detected and treated. And as time goes on, I believe that number is going to underestimate the number of people out there who have cancer that is undiagnosed. These are some data from our health equity research group. And it's actually being presented at ASCO this year, uh, next week. They looked at cancer pathology reports from SEER registries in two states, in Georgia and Louisiana, and compared 2019 to 2020. So this is a surrogate marker for the amount, the number of cancer cases. And it points out a problem with our healthcare system where we can't get data in real time. So we have to, to do, do surrogates. These data are in real time. If you look at the, in the box, about 30,000 there were 30,000 fewer pathology reports or cancer diagnoses in 2020 compared to 2019. So 30,000 in two states. So that's a lot more than 80,000 if you just do the math there. So I believe there's a lot more patients out there who we need to find and treat. The numbers uh, in the box, you can see uh, lung had the, the uh, greatest percent of decline and other sites such as gastric, uh, significant numbers of, of undiagnosed patients there. So this is predicted to result in excess deaths from, cholera, from, uh, from cancer in general. This is a study from the NCI from Ned Sharpless where they looked at colorectal and breast and really modeled it. So again, it was the modeling approach and they're predicting about 10,000 excess deaths Again, yeah, I believe that's going to be on the low side, but you can see in this graph that this is gonna extend across the decade and beyond cumulative excess deaths from cancer the, as a result of the changes from the COVID pandemic, particularly in screening. So whenever you have a crisis, there's always challenges and, and, and there's also opportunities. So how can we emerge better than we were before? We weren't that great at screening. Uh, it, it, we, were, we didn't have the sufficient rates and in the disparities in the underserved, we were even, we had even lower rates. So we wanna improve from where we were before the pandemic. And we really wanna reach into the underserved where the disparities are worsening with COVID. In fact, the American Cancer Society's top priority this year is a return to screening initiative. 
Uh, we've, we have it across the country and have multiple steps that I won't go into tonight, but you can find more information and you can download uh, messages for your patients and so forth and different populations uh, on our website. But this is a critical, uh, it's a public health crisis that we get people back into screening. And then uh, we also want to innovate our approaches to prevention and early detection. And this is where I'll introduce this top, this prevent, intercept, and cure to you. Prevent, intercept, and cure. Now we've actually used intercept as part of some NFL funding for screening, a crucial catch, you know, intercepting a pass, whatever. Johnson & Johnson has put this forth because there, there's a shift in pharma to earlier diagnosis and earlier treatment which fits in perfectly with minimally invasive surgery. The pharma execs are saying, well, wait a minute, we, if we uh, make a drug that costs $100,000 to treat one patient and extends that patient's life three months, that's probably not sustainable. So getting in earlier in the diagnosis uh, in that uh, so, so making earlier diagnoses are, are, uh, are really critical. So prevent, intercept, and cure. So let's talk about prevent first. What's the number one thing you can do to prevent cancer? Don't smoke. So tobacco is at the top of the list. Uh, the good news is the, current, the trends in cigarette smoking are down. You can see on this slide uh, uh, for males and both males and females by uh, race and ethnicity, significant drops in the overall tobacco use. However, if you, if you subset this by education, and which is a surrogate marker for socioeconomic status, so if you think of people who have high school education or below versus everyone else, look at the rates here, 26, 35, 22%. So these are trends in tobacco in the, the populations in, in, with socioeconomic disparities. There's a lot we need to do there. That's not for tonight. But gastric cancer is associated with tobacco use. So we will undoubtedly see that in these populations. Another risk factor is the rising rates of, uh, of obesity. In the United States, the obesity has, has been rising continually. And in this graph shows between 1976 to 80, it was about 15%. Look at how it's climbed. Now it's up to about 40%, 40% of people in the United States are obese and, and it gets worse. It, uh, it, it's, it, it, in fact, obesity will soon overtake tobacco is the greatest risk factor for cancer. And if you add in those who are overweight with those who are obese, about 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese, 70%. That's a take home number, 70%. And it's even in adolescents and children. You can look at the, this is in the 30s, the high 30s for adolescents and children. So obesity is uh, an epidemic and we're going to have to understand how to control it. And we're gonna to need to understand why it's associated with cancer. What are those, those mechanisms? So what about gastric cancer? And let's, let's focus for a bit on the demographics of gastric cancer. Well, obesity is linked to gastric cardiac cancer. It's, it's definitely an obesity-related cancer, and it's relatively stable in its incidence uh, across all age groups. In this graph, if you look at the, the age of diagnosis, you can see it's fairly stable in the gastric cardia. But when you look in non-cardiac cancer, it's a different story. There's a significant increase in young adults if you look at, at the, the graph on the left, that age 50, if you look to the left, you'll see that the annual change is positive. So between one and 3% per year increase in those under 50, while it continues to decrease in those who are over 50. And this is a birth cohort effect. So for the 1970s and 80s shown here, you can see this birth cohort, if you were born in these, these time frames your risk is going up each year. So gastric cardia is, is uh, or not, uh, non-cardia is a bit different. This is uh, predominantly in non-Hispanic whites that where this, these data are from. 
so it's an overall decline, except for those under 50 where it's increasing. And this birth cohort effect is more pronounced in women than in men. So if you were born in 1983, a woman born in 1983, your risk is twofold higher than if you were born in 1951. So it's predicted by 2030 that the incidence will not be decreasing overall and the female incidence will exceed male rates. So female will have a high, females will have a higher rates than men and the rates will start going back up within the next 10 years. The reasons are unclear and it's likely not related to H. pylori in this, in this case. So interception of gastric cancer, how do we intercept it? Well, we don't have routine screenings, right? Where it's not an approved screen, we could screen with upper endoscopy, and, but, but that's, the incidence isn't high enough for that to be a recommended screen. So what can we do to intercept gastric cancer? And I believe the answer to that is in blood-based di cancer diagnostics. The evolving multi-cancer early detection tests or MCEDs. You're gonna hear a lot about these. In fact, one's about to be approved uh, very soon, probably this week. But this is where you go to your doc, you're getting your, your, your physical, whatever, you go down the hall to the lab, you get your blood drawn, you'll get a tube drawn for the MCED, which will look at a variety of cancers up to as many as 50 cancers in some of these tests, and, and we'll predict whether you have a cancer. We believe this is an opportunity to reduce mortality by pulling time forward for earlier stage of diagnosis, and then you'll reduce the cost of treatment. It's rapidly expanding in the commercial spaces and the academic spaces. I'll talk about the technologies in a second. Uh, Freenome, Grail, Thrive are the companies that are making these. There's intense competition for, among their, those companies. And the long-term approvals and so forth, we, we have to see based on longer-term studies. But, um, but this, is, this is where the future is, is heading, I, I believe. So how does it work? So what are these? How do they detect this? Well, Cancer cells, I, like, I think of them as, as being so shameless that when they set up shop, they have to show their presence. And so they, they secrete things into the blood, including DNA. So they, they have cell-free DNA, CF DNA, cell-free DNA. And you can measure methylation sites on the DNA. You can sequence it. You can look at protein biomarkers, um, even RNA biomarkers. And there's technology out there for that. But typically right now we're measuring, we're isolating the circulating tumor DNA and sequencing it. And the, the secret sauce of all these tests are what methylation sites they use. It's, 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 it, that's that's the, the proprietary thing. It's kind of like the, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken secret blend of 13 herbs and spices or whatever. That's what they have their secret blends of methylation sites that can detect the cancers. So these are the different uh, uh, tests that are out there. Pan-seer has uh, five cancers, all of which are, are very treatable, including stomach cancer. There was a paper in Nature Communications about its success. Thrive has the Cancer Seek, which also uses proteins. Um, Grail is, was the earliest, and they look at 100,000 different regions. And they, by doing this, they can also predict to the, the site of origin, the tumor of origin, where, where it came from, which is, is uh, an important point. So I'll just show you some, uh, over, some results of GRAIL that, um, again, this is, we, we are looking at the, in our laboratory resources, we, we follow cohorts for years and years and years who have blood at the time they join. So we're looking to validate these tests no matter what company, no matter what academic institution, it's an act of collaboration at, at ACS. Grail has looked in other, this is not ACS data, but they looked at uh, about 4,000 patients, um, cancers in 2,800, not, no cancers in 1,200. They picked up uh, 1,400 of these 2,800 and only six were false positives. So it's a very high specificity which is good, but a low sensitivity. I mean, 51% is not, uh, it, when there's no test, that's um, not bad. But 
the it looks like the GI cancers in particular are going to be sensitive, more sensitive than other cancers. And here's the data for stomach cancer you know, out of these patients. In, in these asymptomatic patients, they picked up gastric cancer in 20 of 30 cases. All four or all 12 stage four patients were picked up, which makes sense because they have more tumor, shedding more tumor DNA into the bloodstream. But if you look from stage one to, to three, you can see that they're even picking up the rare patient in stage one, but also stage two and stage three. So these are very early results. It's, it's very early days, but I wanted to give you a flavor of these MCEDs because they will be the rage at, as time goes on. There'll be multiple tests that, that, that will be forthcoming. And I do believe we're going to pull time forward for diagnosis at an earlier stage. There's evidence that we can do that. And, and, and I believe that will fit in very well with minimally invasive surgery I think it will also be a way to address disparities um, in implementing these tests and disparities. The questions are how, what's our long-term validation of mortality reduction, and ultimately how do we get it past the U.S. Presentative Service Task Force as an approved test um, so that it can be covered by uh, Medicare and, and so forth. But um, this will be routine. So just to, to, to summarize and conclude, the COVID pandemic has caused a lot of ongoing delays in cancer screening and treatment that are probably worse than predicted and will have long-term repercussions over the decade. Best preventive efforts right now are tobacco and obesity, both of which relate at some point to, to gastric cancer. Gastric cancer is being diagnosed at earlier ages and more frequently in younger women. And prevent, intercept, and cure is on the horizon. As we get these innovations in diagnostics, we'll have positive effects on the implementation of minimally invasive surgical approaches, which we believe will ultimately cure our patients with uh, uh, much uh, less invasive uh, at earlier stage cancer. So thanks for, for the privilege of speaking this evening. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kans. It was amazing talk. It was surprising data, uh, statistics related to the cancer mortality, impact of COVID and cancer care and obesity. Those are all surprising. And it is quite exciting to hear about the possibility for the uh, uh, cancer detection screening uh, using the blood sample. Uh, it's emerging technology and we're looking forward to hear more about this emerging technology and uh, looking forward to improve the, the cancer outcomes of, in the United States. So uh, for, the uh, time, for the time limitation, we have much, uh, multiple questions at the end, but uh, it is my great pleasure uh, uh, to introduce Dr. Kaylin Kelly, uh, next speaker. Dr. Kaylin, uh, Kelly is a surgical oncologist and is associate professor of surgery at UC San Diego. Uh, and her primary focus of uh, practice is treatment of uh, patient uh, treatment of patients with gastric cancer using minimally invasive approach. Uh, she's going to talk about the status of implementation of minimally invasive approach for gastric cancer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelly, and it is yours. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you to the entire committee for the opportunity to participate in this session. Uh, and I agree that was an excellent first talk. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen now. <clears throat> I was asked to speak on the status of minimally invasive surgery in gastric cancer care and where we are with MIS adoption. Um, can everyone see my screen? You may just want to flip flip screens. We're seeing the uh, presenting view. How's that? That's good. Okay, great. So I have no disclosures. 
As an overview of my talk, I'm going to discuss a little bit of the history of minimally invasive gastrectomy, which I will abbreviate MIG. Uh, I think I'm going to include some data from on minimally invasive gastrectomy from both high and low incidence countries, um, divided up into studies focusing on early stage disease, advanced stage disease, those looking at short-term post-operative outcomes, and then data on long-term oncologic outcomes. I think some discussion of the existing data and minimally invasive gastrectomy is kind of integral to understanding MIS adoption and is part of the same story. So that's sort of the adoption is kind of encompassed throughout the talk. And just to mention my background on this slide, this is from the Global Can 2018 cancer statistics that highlights what we all know. Uh, one of the features of gastric cancer is the marked geographic uh, variability in incidence or heterogeneity in insulin in incidence of this disease with very high incidence in certain parts of the world, for example, countries in East Asia, particularly Japan, Korea, and China, um, also some areas in Eastern Europe, South America, and Central America, uh, whereas in countries uh, like the United States and, and Western Europe is relatively low incidence and and what goes hand in hand with that is less surgeon experience. So the history of minimally invasive gastrectomy um, kind of goes back to 1994 when laparoscopic distal gastrectomy was first described by Kitano and colleagues in Japan. Now, gastrectomy for cancer is a technically challenging operation even done open. Um, the figures here are from the Operative Standards for Cancer Surgery Manual, which is a publication put out by the American, Can um, American College of Surgeons Clinical Research Committee and uh, the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. And the aim of this publication is to define critical elements for high quality cancer surgery. And in the volume two, they do incorporate minimally invasive approaches to gastrectomy for cancer. Um, and so these figures are, are from that section. And as everyone uh, can imagine, with it being a technically challenging operation open, it is even more so with small incisions like shown in this figure. Um, following that initial uh, laparoscopic distal gastrectomy that was reported in 1994, uh, laparoscopic total gastrectomy was described in 1999. And then robotic gastrectomy for cancer was first reported by Hashizumi in 2003. Again, now this slide summarizes a retrospective study that was published following that initial report of laparoscopic distal gastrectomy in Japan. Uh, this study, the, the fact that it was published at all, uh, highlights the very rapid adoption of minimally invasive gastrectomy in Japan. This study was published by the Japanese Laparoscopic Surgery Study Group, and it was conducted between April of 1994 and December of 2003, and there were 1,294 patients included who underwent a minimally invasive gastrectomy during that time period for early stage gastric cancer. The authors reported very low post-operative morbidity rates. Um, most patients in the study had laparoscopic distal gastrectomy and the morbidity rate was 13%. It was 19% for laparoscopic proximal gastrectomy and 11% for lap total gastrectomy. They also reported excellent five-year disease-free survival results for all procedures in this study. And the figure over on the right shows the disease-free survival stratified by stage and also highlights that most of the patients in this study had stage one disease. Following this, several randomized prospective trials were developed and put into place. And this meta-analysis nicely summarizes some of those early trials as well as, well as other uh, non-randomized studies. I would call your attention to the column that shows the nation of origin. Once again, all of these are coming from the Eastern high incidence countries. And I will focus on the uh, five randomized trials. I'm sorry, the, it seems like my, and oh, there we go. My <laughs> animations on my slides were not working. Um, these five randomized trials were among some of the first to be performed. These studies were conducted in the late 90s, uh, 
to early 2000s and were reported in the early 2000s. They were relatively small in terms of sample sizes, of patients going, uh, undergoing laparoscopic distal gastrectomy versus open, again, for early stage disease. And then uh, the last study here was a little bit larger. This meta-analysis reported improved short-term outcomes associated with lap a distal gastrectomy. Particularly, there was reduced overall post-operative morbidity with a relative risk of 0.58 compared to open procedures. There was also reduced operative blood loss, analgesic consumption post-operatively, and reduced hospital length of stay. The authors concluded that laparoscopic distal gastrectomy may be a technical, technically feasible alternative for early gastric cancer when it is performed in experienced centers However, they warned that uh, these, the current evidence was not able to exclude potential harms, especially in the node positive cases, and they called for meth methodologically high quality studies. And that is what per was performed next. Uh, this slide summarizes the class 01 study that came from Korea. This was a multi-center randomized controlled trial with 15 participating surgeons at 13 centers. This study compared laparoscopic versus open distal gastrectomy, again, for early stage gastric cancer. It was a non-inferiority designed for overall survival, and the study enrolled 1,416 patients between January of 2006 and August 2010. Here are some of the results. Um, again, most patients in the study, but not quite all, had distal gastrectomy. The laparoscopic arm resulted in longer operative time, uh, which was a statistically significant difference. Also less estimated blood loss. Uh, also in this study, there were fewer lymph nodes, however, still a median of 40 lymph nodes removed with laparoscopic procedures and a shorter hospital length of stay. And then in terms of post-operative morbidity, the rates were low in both groups, but statistically significantly lower in the laparoscopic group, 13.7% versus 18.9%. There were no differences in, some, in the major intra-abdominal complications that can occur, but the, the, overall, the difference in overall complications was really driven by wound complications, particularly dehiscence. Long-term results from this study were only very recently published that showed uh, excellent, again, long-term oncologic outcomes. These two figures show the overall survival results and the cancer-specific survival results. The five-year overall survival was 93 and 94% for open and laparoscopic surgery, and the five-year cancer-specific survival was about 97% in both groups. And so the conclusion uh, was that for early-stage disease, uh, laparoscopic dysphagastrectomy was not inferior. Now, laparoscopic total gastrectomy has also been evaluated uh, in randomized prospective trials, however, and not as large of, of, of studies. This slide summarizes a prospective trial of lap versus open total gastrectomy for patients with stage one disease. The primary endpoints of this study were 30-day morbidity and mortality. Overall, the post-operative complication rate was 18% with lap total gastrectomy versus 17% in open, with only one mortality in the lap group, but no difference between the groups in mortality. There was, again, increased operative time in the laparoscopic group, but decreased blood loss, and there were no differences in margin status or the length of the proximal margin or in lymph node retrieval, which was, again, high in both groups. And once again, the conclusion in this Eastern study from a high volume center was the lab total gastrectomy is not inferior to open in terms of these short term post operative endpoints. However, this study did not report long term oncologic outcomes. So, what about long term outcomes in locally advanced disease? Two fairly recent publications have reported long term results from the large uh, Korean and Chinese studies of laparoscopic gastrectomy in locally advanced cancer. The class O2 study from Korea enrolled patients from 2005 to 2015. There were 1,050 patients, and the three year recurrence free survival rates were excellent in both groups 80.3% for laparoscopic versus 81.3% in open. And the results from that study are shown in the figures that I have here. Uh, panel A is for all patients that were included. B is for stage one patients. Oh. 
uh, C is stage two and D is stage three. However, when uh, you may ask in looking at this, why were there any stage one patients? And I'll comment on that in a moment. But also the, the class of one study from China enrolled patients for a shorter period of time, but had about the same number of patients. And the three-year recurrence free survival rates were 76 and 77% for laparoscopic versus open. I put an asterisk there to comment on both of these studies. Um, patients, a, a significant proportion of the patients were overstaged at their initial workup and actually had pathologic stage one disease. And so we do have to keep in mind that uh, these survival results did include a significant portion of stage one patients. Um, so where are we with data on minimally invasive gastrectomy in Western countries? As has been pointed out somewhat in the previous talk, and I think we'll, we'll, something we will discuss a lot today is the differences in presentation in, in, in the disease in Western and Eastern countries, or in, I should say, uh, high incidence versus low incidence countries. Gastric cancer has a relatively low incidence in Western Europe and the US with approximately 20 to 21,000 new cases per year in the US. And differences in presentation also exist, such as higher BMI, um, greater incidence of proximal cancers and with patients coming with more advanced disease at presentation because of the lack of any uh, screening modalities currently. And this study is a uh, meta-analysis that compared minimally invasive and open gastrectomy for gastric cancer as performed in Europe. Um, the, there were 18 original studies included, one of which was a randomized controlled trial, which to my knowledge remains the only randomized controlled trial that's been done or that's been completed at least in a, in a Western country. It was published by Husher and colleagues. The studies included, uh, 13 of them were compared laparoscopic gastrectomy to open, three compared robotic to open, and two robotic to laparoscopically. Now, only four of the studies had greater than 50 patients per arm, and there were really no differences found in node retrieval, anastomotic or duodenal stump leak. I apologize. Uh, anastomotic dehiscence, postoperative hemorrhage, reoperation rates, or operative or postoperative mortality. There was, however, actually higher operative morbidity in the laparoscopic group versus open with a relative risk of 1.96, so almost double the risk. And uh, there was reduced blood loss and length of stay with minimally invasive approaches. Now, just as a observer interpreting this data, uh, the higher morbidity in the laparoscopic group in a in, in, uh, lower incidence or less experienced uh, surgeons performing the studies, um, one might interpret it that the reason for the, the higher morbidity is less experience with the procedure. Now, this table summarizes some data from the United States. This is from a review published by uh, Dr. Strong and her colleagues. These show some small single institution series in the US. And these studies basically showed, um, here, here's the number of patients who underwent minimally invasive gastrectomy. There was no operative mortality in any of these studies. The lymph node year, yield was, for, was variable. Um, estimated blood loss was fairly consistently less in the laparoscopic group. And complications, overall complications and length of stay were lower in the majority of these studies. So we're starting to see some of the same results uh, demonstrated in the high volume country studies in the US as well. This, is, uh, this slide summarizes what is probably the largest study comparing minimally invasive to open gastrectomy in a Western country carried out at Memorial Sloan Kettering. This was a retrospective comparison of patients who had R1, a minimally invasive versus open gastrectomy between January of 2007 and June of 2017. And this included 311 patients who had either laparoscopic or robotic gastrectomy. The minimally invasive approach was associated with greater node retrieval and 30-day 30, 30 overall morbidity was lower in the minimally invasive group, and this was statistically significant. Overall complications were also still statistically significantly less in an adjusted analysis in the laparoscopic group, and length of stay was shorter. 
And then of note in a subset analysis between robotic and laparoscopic cases, the robotic, uh, the robotic approach was associated with a shorter operative time, greater node retrieval, and fewer conversions to open procedures. These uh, figures show the long-term survival results. This is for disease-specific survival. In all patients, there was a statistically significant improvement in the minimally invasive group. However, this is an unadjusted analysis and uh, was likely related to patient selection for minimally invasive surgery. But when compared stage for stage, there were no differences in survival outcomes suggesting that the minimally invasive approach is not uh, inferior to the open approach. Uh, this is another study that is also from Memorial, so talking about some of these same patients uh, where patients underwent uh, focusing on robotic gastrectomy. And something I thought is interesting about this study is that this is a scenario where robotic gastrectomy was offered broadly to patients with gastric cancer. There weren't strict selection criteria. Uh, and when doing this, the completion rate for completing the procedure successfully robotically was 72%. The median node retrieval was 28. R0 resection was achieved in 99% of cases. And the oper operative time actually decreased over time as uh, experience was gained with the procedure. And the rate of major morbidity was only 7% uh, with less than 1% mortality. This study also identified some factors associated with conversion to open, which were having a body mass index of greater than or equal to 31 kilograms per meter squared, having received neoadjuvant therapy, which about 35% of the patients in the study did, and having a tumor size greater than six centimeters. So in terms of MIS or MIG adoption, where are we now? That is the question um, posed for, for this talk. And it's hard to answer that question um, well, because there's not a lot of data specifically addressing that. However, I did find a survey that was administered to members of the International Gastric Cancer Association. This is a little bit dated because it was done back in September of 2013 to January 2014. And the response rate was only about 37% for people in, this, in the group actually responding to the survey. However, it showed that preferences for minimally invasive gastrectomy varied significantly by region. The first figure here is from Asia, which most of the responding surgeons were from, were from Asia. And you can see in the black bars um, show those who prefer minimally invasive gastrectomy. So for distal and early cancers, that was strongly preferred. As I showed, you know, most of the data is for patients uh, undergoing distal gastrectomy for early stage disease. And that's where I think the role of minimal, minimally invasive gastrectomy is the most established. In terms of distal advanced cancers at that time, open gastrectomy was still preferred, uh, even in high volume countries. Uh, in terms of total gastrectomy for early stage disease, minimally invasive was preferred. And in total, in for total gastrectomy for advanced disease, open surgery was still preferred. And then looking at South America, uh, it was about 50-50 for distal gastrectomy and early stage disease, but surgeons preferred open gastrectomy for these other uh, scenarios. And finally, in Europe, um, kind of the same story, open gastrectomy was preferred uh, for all scenarios. It'd be interesting to see those results now. Um, in the United States, the National Cancer Database is an uh, important resource for understanding what's going on with cancer care worldwide and at, at all center types, including uh, community programs and large academic centers. Um, the National Cancer Database is a, a hospital registry database that's collected at over 1,500 Commission on Cancer accredited sites, and it is thought to, the data in it is thought to represent over 70% of the uh, cancer, newly diagnosed cancer cases. What recent studies using the NCDB have shown is that approximately 20 to 23% of gastrectomies for cancer are being performed minimally invasively in the U.S. I will comment, though, that uh, with the NCDB, the data on whether the surgical approach for a gastrectomy, whether it's being done open or minimally invasively, only started to be being collected in 2010. That's nearly 30 years after laparoscopic gastrectomy was first described, again, in Japan. 
Um, but uh, current data from the NCDB does also show that minimally invasive gastrectomy is increasing over time. And currently it is more often performed at academic centers and on patients with private insurance and earlier stage disease. Going back to the operative standards for cancer surgery, which is again a manual that strives to define critical elements for high quality cancer surgery. The recommendation in this publication is that minimally invasive surgery is recommended as a suitable alternative to open surgery for cases, including but not limited to early and distal cancer. And that minimally invasive gastrectomy for cancer requiring total gastrectomy can be recommended when a surgeon's expertise is adequate. And finally, robotic surgery for gastric cancer has been suggested to be non-inferior to lapros laparoscopic, and the robot may provide surgeons who are less experienced with laparoscopy with the ability to safely perform uh, high-quality gastrectomy for cancer. In summary, the data are by far most abundant from Eastern countries. However, uh, Western studies, particularly at higher volume centers, have shown some of the same results uh, as shown in the Eastern studies. And studies reporting long-term outcomes um, show no differences in recurrence free or disease specific or overall survival for distal gastrectomy in early stage disease. Long-term data for advanced disease are not as, as established, but also suggest no differences. And minimally invasive gastrectomy is a standard practice and preferred in high volume Easter countries. Um, adoption remains slower, but it's increasing in low volume countries. And these are just some images from our team performing a lap gastrectomy here. So thank you. And I think we're saving questions for the end. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Caitlin. What, what an outstanding talk. And um, you know, I'd like to point out that a few of the large uh, randomized prospective studies from the East were uh, partly accomplished by Dr. Wu Jin Young, who's going to be our speaker a little bit later uh, in the hour. Um, so I, I want to go right on to our next talk since we're running a few minutes behind. And it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Josh Dada, who is the Assistant Professor of Clinical Surgery in the Department of Surgical Oncology at the University of Miami in Miami. Florida. He's also a recent graduate of our program at MD Anderson, was one of our superstar fellows, as Caitlin Kelly also was <laughs> a few years prior. And we have the pleasure of having him speak today uh, on the topic of hurdles of MIS adoption. So Caitlin has, uh, Dr. Kelly set up a nice segue for us to go right into Dr. Dada's talk. Go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Strong. Um, can everybody see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Great. So uh, thank you to the uh, moderators, Dr. Strong, and um, the societies for giving me the opportunity tonight to talk about this. So I've been tasked with talking about hurdles to adoption of minimally invasive gastrectomy. And for this talk, I have no uh, relevant uh, disclosures. And I, uh, I do have one comment that I, that I'm a strong proponent of uh, minimally invasive gastrectomy, even though I'll be talking to you about the hurdles um, that are associated with the adoption of such a technique. So this is my outline. I'll define the central problem. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the, the etiologies of why um, uh, there are so many barriers to the adoption of minimally invasive gastrectomy in the United States in particular. And then eventually it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I'm going to give you a flavor of some strategies to mitigate some of these hurdles to MIG adoption. Uh, so the central problem is something that um, all of us recognize. Um, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, uh, there's increasing evidence to suggest that minimum invasive gastrectomy is safe and it's associated with uh, similar short-term and long-term oncologic outcomes compared with open gastrectomy. But as we have also recognized, a overwhelming majority of that data is really from the East, and it's unclear whether that vast experience from Asia can be extrapolated to at least uh, US patients for several reasons that I'll talk about. Um, and uh, accordingly, as Dr. Kelly alluded to, the adoption of minimally invasive gastrectomy in the United States has been particularly slow. This is actually data that I pulled uh, from the NCDB uh, for this talk in um, uh, uh, thanks to uh, one of our clinical collaborators at Emory, and this actually looks at the percent of patients that actually completed 
minimally invasive gastrectomy. And as of 2017, only 12% of the cases were actually being completed uh, without conversion to open, where the vast majority of cases were still being uh, done open in the United States. Now, as she also mentioned, this is not a population-based registry, but it does capture over 70% of cancer cases. So that's a stark reality. And, and really the, the first and, and decidedly major uh, hurdle to adoption of minimally invasive gastrectomy is the learning curve that's associated with technical and oncologic conduct of the operation. That's really gonna be the, the, uh, the, the topic for the next uh, uh, subpart. And, and I'm gonna juxtapose the learning curve that we have learned from uh, um, studies in Asia uh, with the uphill battle to achieve such learning curves given the volume issues and some of the uh, physiologic and biologic considerations I'll discuss in a few minutes. So for what is considered to be the most straightforward minimally invasive gastrectomy, that is the minimally invasive distal gastrectomy for early gastric cancer, the early experience from Asia estimates that the learning curve is anywhere between 40 and 90 cases. This is an often cited study that examined a single center experience with over 350 laparoscopic distal gastrectomies and they tabulated operative time and estimated blood loss as a metric for operative proficiency, which I guess you could debate, but they looked at 12 sequential groups of 30 cases. And as you can see from the figure, the learning curve, which was calculated by a conventional cumulative sum method was estimated at 40 to 60 cases. Now this is for laparoscopic distal gastrectomy for early gastric cancer. This is uh, another often cited paper from a prominent Japanese group reporting on 100 laparoscopic uh, distal gastrectomies between 2000 and 2006. And as you can see from the table, it also took this group an estimated 40 to 60 cases for operative time, blood loss, and lymph node harvest arrival, and then subsequently eclipse open distal gastrectomy. So keep that number in mind. The learning curve for minimally invasive total gastrectomy may be even more daunting. Um, in the largest series examining this specific question, operative time and estimated blood loss uh, uh, were tracked in 256 cases uh, um, between 2003 and 2012, and in 10 sequential groups of 25 cases and using the same methodology. And if you look at the actual data, the authors estimate that it would take 100 laparoscopic total gastrectomies for operative proficiency. Now, admittedly, the, the learning curve with robotic gastrectomy is likely faster compared with laparoscopic gastrectomy for both distals and totals. But even if this number is 30 for distals and 50 for totals, just imagine what those numbers mean for even a high volume US gastric cancer surgeon who may on average perform fewer than 20 gastrectomies for cancer per year. And it's really a matter of arithmetic. If you don't have enough cases favorable for minimally invasive gastrectomy, the learning curve is just going to be prohibitive to achieve. Here is a joint point regression analysis from the CR database of cases with localized and regional gastric cancer per 100,000 of the US population. So you heard Dr. Kelly say that there was 21,000 cases in total. But if you really look at the patients that are amenable to surgical intervention, that number is really about 10,000. And this incidence pales in comparison to other regions of the world, namely Asia and Latin America. These are data from a recent Lancet paper documenting the global burden of gastric cancer. And you can see where uh, North America ranks in terms of gastric cancer incidence compared with Asia and Latin America. And I pulled these data from the NCDB for this talk. Again, thanks to our, our collaborator, Emery. And uh, this graph shows the number of gastrectomies, uh, regardless of whether it was performed open or minimally invasive, performed at every hospital on average every year between 2011 and 2017. And there are about 1,100 to 1,200 institutions that contribute data to the NCDB. So you can look here, between 2011 and 2017, the average number of gastrectomies per year, per institution, covers around seven and a half. So again, just playing the math teacher here, and I, and I admittedly hate math, if we accept the learning curve numbers that I showed you earlier, and if every case at every hospital in the US were done minimally invasively, which is still a stretch. It would take five years to achieve proficiency with distals and 13 years to achieve proficiency with totals. Now I understand those numbers are not going to be seen in 2020 as they were in 2019 uh, and 2009, um, but, uh, but those are some, some uh, uh, daunting numbers. And that is assuming, and it's a big assumption that every case would actually be favorable for minimally invasive gastrectomy which dovetails nicely into my next point regarding the hurdles to adoption, which has to do with patient selection for minimally invasive gastrectomy. 
So as, as you heard, in addition to fewer available cases, patient selection is relatively unfavorable in the United States, given the increased presentation with more locally advanced disease, proximal tumors, as well as a significantly higher average BMI of the US population, as you heard Dr. Kans mention. Uh, as you well know, um, a presentation with earlier disease uh, in the East is due to more robust screening protocols and higher incidence of disease. And patients in the US overwhelmingly present with more locally advanced disease compared with early stages of disease. Uh, this is our data from, uh, from the University of Miami where we see a large volume of patients from the Caribbean, Central and South America where gastric cancer is endemic. Uh, and while these data are likely a little skewed because the University of Miami and Jackson are a truly a safety net health system, it is also true that a majority of these cases, nearly 90% of patients who present at our institution uh, present with locally advanced gastric cancer, and many of these are bulky tumors, uh, are not the best suited for our minimally invasive approach. In addition to presentation at more advanced stages, patients with gastric cancer in the United States present disproportionately with proximal tumors, as you also heard earlier in uh, this session. Based on the SEER data, the incidence of cardia and gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma has risen fivefold in the last two decades, while the overall incidence of distal cancers has uh, decreased somewhat. Uh, now, these proximal tumors obviously would require total or proximal gastrectomies with the incident issues with the minimally invasive platform that I mentioned earlier with that operation. Another major obstacle uh, to the routine application of minimally invasive gastrectomy is the staggering burden of obesity that you also heard about earlier. And I'll give you some, some, some data here to, to talk about its tangible impact. This is an obes uh, obesity map from the CDC where you can compare the rates of obesity in North America vis-a-vis -vis Asia. And uh, on a lighter note, you'll see some videos later on in the, in the session today. I'm sure many of the American surgeons have wistfully watched those laparoscopic or robotic gastrectomy videos from Asia and secretly wish that one or two of those patients would actually walk into your office. Uh, but, uh, but jokes aside, the obesity epidemic is a, is a major impediment to minimally invasive gastrectomy adoption in the United States. Uh, this is an editorial that Dr. Strong and I wrote on the uh, class, the C um, uh, class 01 trial, which was the laparoscopic distal gastrectomy trial for locally advanced gastric cancer that Dr. Kelly briefly mentioned. And I pulled out an excerpt from our manuscript where we wrote, the mean BMI in both arms in the class 01 trial was 22.7. With obesity rampant in the US, it is rare for even high volume centers to see many patients with such BMIs. The impact of body habitus on the technical conduct of minimally invasive gastrectomy cannot be overemphasized. Uh, and so in conglomerate, the issues and the hurdles to minimally invasive adoption in uh, US and, and the Western patients from a patient selection perspective that I've outlined uh, actually have a tangible impact on the successful technical conduct of minimally invasive gastrectomy. Again, this, uh, Dr. Kelly briefly mentioned these data. Uh, this was a robust experience from Dr. Strong and colleagues at uh, Sloan Kettering uh, of 220 robotic gastrectomies and certainly a tour de force experience that's hard to rival at most institutions in the West. But, uh, but in their honest appraisal of their data, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as, as Dr. Kelly mentioned earlier, they reported their conversion data. And again, uh, it was really interesting for me to see that of the 61 conversions, the same culprits that we've just talked about, Locally advanced gastric cancers require neoadjuvant chemotherapy, larger, bulkier, more advanced tumors, and high BMI were the um, were multifactorial reasons why patients required conversion to open surgery. And these factors are certainly reflected in the selection of minimally invasive gastrectomy nationally. This is a paper that we wrote in 2015 looking at data from the NCDB where we showed that minimally invasive gastrectomy was disproportionately selected for smaller tumors and less frequently used for more locally advanced disease. And in the minimally invasive gastrectomy cohort, the R0 resection uh, proportion was associated with distal cancers less than five centimeters. Now jumping uh, ahead to more of a, a theoretical construct uh, in, our, uh, in our capitalist healthcare economy, but, but uh, another challenge nonetheless, which is collinear with the issues that I've discussed um, is um, really the lack of centralization to these high volume centers. Um, and, and, and it's a really a, a, an important uh, policy. But strongly as we try to optimize our outcomes for our states is less than eight. And a majority of those resections are actually performed disproportionately in low volume hospitals. 
there are actually data supporting that centralization of gastric cancer to high volume centers may actually not only increase the utilization of minimally invasive gastrectomy, but also improve surgical quality. So there was a Dutch study that showed that centralization of care to high volume centers increased the rate of laparoscopy for gastric cancer resection from 6% to 40%, decreased blood loss, increased the proportion of patients that had more than 15 loads harvested and examined by pathology from 21% to 93% and decreased state. Again, I, I, the utilization is really hard to say this legitimate hurdle to the uh, widespread uh, adoption of minimum invasive gastrectomy in the US. And finally, uh, a few uh, moments on uh, infrastructural and trading related challenges. Um, obviously, you know, uh, the minimally adoption of a minimum invasive platform requires substantial investment on the part of an institution. And they have to commit to this uh, minimum invasive technology. As a, as a fellow at Sloan Kettering, I, I really saw that uh, uh, firsthand. And, uh, and, you know, I've been fortunate at our institution at the University of Miami where we've really reimagined our, our uh, robotic platform and our ORs. These are redesigned ORs where you can see the booms and the consoles are, are, um, are designed for uh, robotic surgery. We have dual consoles in every room and one console on the opposite side where uh, the resident and the fellow sits and they can uh, scrub in and uh, uh, get to the bedside pretty quickly. We have dedicated surgical technologists and we have first assists that are uh, that are that are only taking care of patients with robotic surgery. And so this takes a significant investment on the part of an institution and the health system to do this and do this in a meaningful way. And while many on the call and many uh, uh, attendees here may be beneficiaries of this uh, of, of, of this infrastructure, many may not be. And I, and, I, and I posit that a majority of the cases that you see being performed laparoscopically or robotically in the United States are not being done at institutions where we have this infrastructure. And, and uh, Allied to that is really training the next generation to be facile with minimal invasive gastrectomy or minimal invasive oncologic surgery in general. So at our institution, we've uh, uh, really invested in, uh, for example, this is a pig lab where uh, I'm taking one of our fellows and our chief residents uh, through a variety of minimal invasive uh, um, foregut and uh, hepatobiliary cases where we do distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, sleeve gastrectomy, and some liver surgery. And, and it's really the investment in our future generations that, that are going to carry forward um, uh, the, the banner of minimum invasive gastrectomy in the United States. And finally, some strategies to mitigate the hurdles to minimum invasive gastrectomy adoption. So it's not all doom and gloom, as I mentioned. Uh, really, we need to focus on early detection strategies as Dr. Kantz uh, uh, talked about so eloquently earlier today to increase the pool of early gastric cancer patients fit for minimum invasive gastrectomy. And, and I'd posit that uh, we need to reevaluate our screening paradigms for high risk populations, such as immigrant, Hispanic, and Asian populations, uh, patients with chronic H. pylori infections, patients who have first degree relatives with a gastric cancer diagnosis, and those with chronic atrophic gastritis or autoimmune gastritis. And just like forums like this, we need to promote a culture of collaboration and partnership, not competition. You know, when we when we get into these micro ecosystems of our healthcare uh, system, you know, people are squabbling over certain cases and and and, and competing over volume. Uh, but it's really forums like this uh, that uh, that you know promote collaboration and help us overcome some of the hurdles uh, that we have to the adoption of minimum invasive gastrectomy in a broad sense. And part of that um, uh, is to partner with industry, uh, obviously maintaining healthy skepticism in that realm, but um, certainly there's a bi-directional uh, mutual benefit there, uh, not only to improve the training of our next generation, but also to overcome uh, learning curve issues. And then I am not an expert in this at all, but maybe we should think about compensation structures to reward innovation and patient-centered outcomes. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll end. Um, thank you very much. I'm just going to leave you with some slides here. Uh, this is the University of Miami campus, um, and this is our South Beach, and they're equidistant from my house. So I welcome each and every one of you to, to Miami and the University of Miami. Thank you very much, Dr. Data. Uh, it was a great talk describing difficulties in implementation of MIS practice for gastric cancer we all share in the United States. Uh, and the implementation of the MIS approach is particularly challenging in council centers. I really hope we can have a discussion later uh, if you have time uh, at the question, uh, the, the session. So let me introduce next speaker, Dr. Yang Gi Wu. 
I hope she is. She she had a uh, the connection issue earlier. No, Yankee, you guys are blocked. You... Can you undo? Can you unlock my video? Because the host is not letting me open it. It says unable to start because host stopped it. Okay. So while we are preparing for our slides, uh, let me continue to introduce her. Dr. Wu is a surgical oncologist and associate professor and director of gastroenterology minimally invasive therapy program at the City of Hope Cancer Center with her special uh, expertise in MIS gastrectomy for gastric cancer. She is going to uh, give us a talk about techniques, technical aspects of the uh, laparoscopic, it was, you know, class, but the mainly robotic approach for the gastric cancer. Thank you, Dr. Como. Thanks to the um, leadership of uh, SAGES and SSO and SSAT, as well as the American Cancer Society for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. I was given the topic, technical, concern, uh, technical comparisons and pearls of gastrectomy for, can um, for cancer, but I had to cross out laparoscopy as uh, most of you know that I don't perform laparoscopic gastric cancer operations except for GIST and maybe a diagnostic lab. So I'm gonna be speaking mostly about robotics today. Um, so I bring you greetings from Southern California at City of Hope. Um, these are my disclosures. When I am not operating, I am um, looking for cures for gastric cancer and part of the Stand Up to Cancer um, Interception Grant team and a um, part of the advisory group for Hope for Stomach Cancer and Debbie Stream Foundation. So almost 100% of my time is dedicated to our gastric cancer patients, both in practice as well as um, in research. So for all that we do, we do for our patients so that no more lives should be lost to this disease. Um, within the context of talking to you about tips and pearls, we can't get away from the fact that this is a cancer operation and it should be centered in a comprehensive cancer care model. And that minimal invasive surgery that I'm gonna talk about today falls into part of innovation and the tools that innovation and technology provides for us. And so how we use those tools, um, and we heard a lot about the evidence and the hurdles and, and the critical evaluation that's been going on, but um, how we overcome those and apply it for adoption for the best outcome of our patients is sort of our goal. And I'm gonna share with you a success story of at a high volume gastric cancer center at City of Hope um, in the United States, where we do perform minimally invasive surgery for all, almost all of our gastric cancer patients. So at City of Hope, we treat about 150 patients diagnosed with gastric gastroesophageal junction. We have a multidisciplinary team. So if you see the pictures on the top, they are surgeons and surgical oncologists and Jay Kim is a thoracic surgeon. Um, we do combo cases for the G-junction tumor. 65%, um, like the other presenters before me said, are um, resectable cases, but they're locally advanced at stage most <clears throat> of the time. And I have the luxury of living in Southern California where um, there is a very mixed group, a high volume of Asian American and Hispanic Americans, at least actually at one third of our patients is Asian American and one third is Hispanic. And we do see the patient population that you talk about that's BMI of 22 and I see the other spectrum BMI of 39. So robotic surgery for all of the surgeons at City of Hope actually is the MIS of choice. Um, and I think this is because the history of where we are um, at City of Hope, there's been more than 10,000 robotic cases performed overall. So the, the culture of innovation um, that's actually supported by our chair is here. So this is just a snapshot of the experience at City of Hope over the past eight years. Uh, radically resected gastric adenocarcinoma, including G-junction tumors. Um, robotic approach has been um, about 80%. And as you can see, there's a fairly even distribution between proximal and distal cancers. And so um, most of these are done by patient um, surgeon selection and our, our open conversion rate is 1.3%. I'm not gonna dwell on um, this because I think the data has been reviewed very, very carefully and more thoroughly prior um, but essentially, um, I believe that robotics for gastric cancer based on all of the available data is safe and feasible and oncologically sound. Um, and obviously um, 
there's more data to come, but benefits of robotics over laparoscopy for gastric cancer are emerging. And it is perhaps to overcome the shorter learning curve, the improved D2 lymphadenectomy and, and the ease of integration of new technology, which is gonna be very important for cancer and targeted therapies. And so this is data for robotic surgery for advanced cancer, which is supportive, that is not inferior. Um, then laparoscopy or open, um, perhaps longer operative time and costly. And this is a study that shows um, that M we reviewed neoadjuvant therapy patients that underwent MIS, a collaboration between um, my colleagues in China and City of Hope. And it really was neoadjuvant therapy was not a risk factor for postoperative complications, but age and size of tumor was. And so I think it was presented before that laparoscopy has tailed off in terms of adoption and so has opened, but it, between 2010 and 2014, there are rapid increases in the adoption of robotics for complex abdominal cancers. And I believe that this is to continue. But at the bottom line, surgical approach for gastric cancer is actually a surgeon's choice at this point. And based on patient factors, tumor characteristics, and surgeon training and experience, I think we can only provide our patients what we are able to do. So personally, because of my training um, uh, that I had in Korea, where there was really high volume, where I learned open laparoscopy and robotics, um, it's been able to offer all of these to our patients, except I don't do laparoscopy. Um, and I, I prefer robotics for the medically fit, um, for the advanced, and those um, when I don't have a skilled assistant. Um, openness approach is reserved for T4AB tumors that are invasive, bulky, that require um, on-block resection, or patients with that cannot tolerate um, longer operative times. So this is just a survey of my colleagues. Um, you can see that there is a wide range of adoption of laparoscopy, highest in Japan um, and um, Italy and uh, US. Uh, this is me and a colleague in Italy has the highest robotic adoption. But it, f this is gonna change because China has also started adopting robotics and that will also increase the time. So. I think it's time for us to integrate robotic surgery for gastric cancer. And um, 2015, when I joined City Folk, this is exactly what we did. Um, as always, it's done in a multidisciplinary fashion. And for those, especially for those with locally advanced cancer after neoadjuvant therapy, where radical gastrectomy is required, is most of where our patients lie. And so we talked about patient selection. Yes, when it's an initial robotic operation, I advise that you pick the younger, healthier to patients who can tolerate longer operative times, the earlier stage of disease, um, the location of lesion distal is easier than proximal. And then with increasing experience, I think obesity and um, higher morbid condition patients can also benefit from this and combined cases are being performed as well. And so um, in preparation, the SAGES Atlas, this is published a couple of years ago, proceeds go to SAGES Foundation, um, but it was, it gives you a good outline of what um, to prepare and as well as the instrumentation that is possible. So I'll show you a video of um, a gastric can two gastric cancer operations and we'll talk about the instrument selection. So this was this video was actually presented previously at SSO as a teaching module um, in a young patient with a locally advanced gastric cancer. This was done a few years a few years back. So we don't um, did not give neoadjuvant therapy at this time because at the time we were giving new, uh, adjuvant chemo radiation. This is an XI system um, and so the pearls and tips of technique that I'd like to share is that the most important arm uh, during the robotic procedure actually is the arm that you cannot see. It's the number one arm, the cardiac arm, that's pulling up the, um, the stomach wall. And so the retraction is probably the most important. And um, to give you this kind of exposure, as I think most of us know that without ex the exposure in a laparoscopic or a robotic case is very different from an open. And without this exposure, you can't complete this operation. 
And so this patient is not that obese. Um, and here we're just getting through all the lymph nodes. And the use of the harmonic, the technique that I learned from Dr. Wu Jun Hyung, who's going to present after me, the master of robotic gastrectomy, um, is, is what I use for most of my patients because it creates a bubble that um, shows you the plane. So um, robotic is very steady and it clips well. So I use a lot of different instruments, but it's appropriate for um, the dissection that is required. So the D2 lymphadenectomy is probably what's difficult to do, um, not the resection itself. Um, so we'll see that you can get around. So I use the Maryland, um, which is a bipolar and use, this is all, um, I have control of all of the four, four arms here. I'm gonna continue on to do the duodenal transection here in the interest of time, I'm just gonna keep moving. The robotic um, stapler that is available these days are okay, but in a skinnier patient, you don't have enough room to manipulate. So I actually prefer the bedside assistant from the assist port. Um, here you see, um, station, we're gonna go after station number eight. This is the GDA and this is lymphadenectomy going towards the suprapancreatic lymph node dissection. And you'll see that the, the ultrasonic creates a nice plane for you to follow. This is the base of the right gastric artery and the nodes around it. Um, and The retraction of the um, third arm, I mean, the first arm actually is retracting the liver. So if you put in a liver retractor, you can use your first arm to um, help you dissect and retract. There's a node on the common hepatic, the node that you see all the time when you do a Whipple, but it's also there when you do a gastrectomy. It's part of the D, um, and to lymph node station. And this is number 12. You can see that it's along the uh, proper hepatic artery and you'll see portal vein coming up on the other side. That's, that's when you know that you have completed the 12A. This is along the common going towards the celiac. Oh, sorry about that. Left gastric. So to, uh, I was taught to put three clips on the left gastric, um, and I do, and I'll show you a little later why um, I don't stay, I, I stapled a few of these and why I don't do it anymore. I clip them three times all the time now. So this is along the suprapancreatic nodal dissection, um, 11P, and this is number, so this here is lymph node station number one, one that is often missed by a lot of surgeons, but it's part of the D1 lymph node station. Um, so at the end of your case, and when you're done with your D2 lymphadenectomy, you should be able to see your vessels. And the portal vein and the head of your pancreas. Very difficult to do laparoscopically. So I do prefer the robot. And this is the resection. Um, I'm gonna skip this portion because I'll, sh I'll go get there um, again. So the outcome of the procedure was um, that the blood loss is very low, as you know, operative time is longer. Um, patient went home on post up day six. She had a six centimeter circumferential antral mass, poorly differentiated. And, and we had um, a good number of lymph nodes retrieved, a 74 and eight of them were positive. I'm gonna show you one more uh, video. It's a total gastrectomy and a, a BM, actually, oh, so this is a yeah, subtotal distal. To show you that we actually see very thin Asian American patients in Southern California. This patient had a BMI of 20, 
and what we thought was an earlier stage cancer. So we did a robotic gastrectomy, but we also did a D2. And um, for those who drool over um, skinny Asian patients, this is, we have a very thin young patient, but she did get a D2 lymphadenectomy because there was risk of nodal metastases. And what happened here is that even if you do the best operation possible, this patient had 21 lymph nodes out of 54 um, lymph nodes positive, and she was staged as three. And Nick, she had um, no markers actually. She was MSI stable, PDL1 negative, HER2 negative, and P53 mutation negative, um, and at a very high risk of recurrence. So she went on to see our medical oncologist. Um, it is expected that our patients, the median length of stay for our review on our ERAS study is 4.4 days. So the patients know that they will be going home around day five. Um, the next video and the tips is gonna come from a total gastrectomy on a patient that is typical of America, asymptomatic uh, BMI of 34.5, found to have a CDH1 mutation, ultrasound shows that um, she has a T1A N1 um, cancer, which is fairly advanced. She went on to get neoadjuvant flot and she underwent a XI robotic total gastrectomy with modified D2 lymphadenectomy. I used a technique that I learned from um, colleagues in China who do this laparoscopically called the complete meso, um, call it excision, which is, I think will be more helpful when in an old, in a um, more obese patient to find the anatomic borders that's embryological. So obviously this patient is more typical of a, a, an American uh, BMI and the challenges that we face. Um, I prefer to use the, um, like the vessel sealer here um, in this case. And actually the vessel sealer new machine is a lot faster, so it cooks much faster. But in this case, we're looking for the infrapancreatic border so we can find the left gastropoblic um, mesentery. It's very difficult to do this um, as everyone was um, speaking about because it's hard to find anatomic borders and, and the depth of where the lymph nodes are. But I think using this new method that's been described by, by Dr. Gong and published um, it's easier to find the borders that we need anatomically to be able to do a complete D2 lymphadenectomy. This is the base of the gastropoploic, um, left gastropoploic uh, vessel here that is going into the splenic. So it, following the, um, the fat planes and the um, anatomic, embryologic an anatomy, I think, the borders of the lymphadenectomy can be performed easier. And so this video just shows you some techniques and it's so important that your number one arm is retracting very well because otherwise you won't be able to see anything here. This is the, um, the right side of the patient now. Um, and I prefer the vessel sealer here over the harmonic because um, it seals a little bit better and gives you a, makes you feel a little bit like um, more in control. Looking through the planes, we are able to get to the, I think this is the right side of the abdomen, get to the right gastropoic vessels, but it, it takes a longer time. So the, robotic case or laparoscopic case versus open, this is a lot longer to do this operation because you can't feel anything. You're just completely dependent on your eyes. Um, here, we're looking for the base of the right gastropoblic vein, which is gonna go, get, go into the middle colic over here and the SMV um, at the head of the pancreas. And we're gonna clip it here. So important to note that the arm that you don't see at all um, is the arm that's creating all your exposure. It's like the attending. You're, the robot num arm number one is your attending. And we're gonna fast forward a little bit further, um, just to note that it's very steady. And I changed back to the harmonic because it's very hard to do a lymphadenectomy when the, the, the planes are being sealed by your vessel sealer. 
So some of the tips, we try not to break the node. Um, it's very difficult not to break the node um, during the dissection. Um, I learned to uh, use a fenestrated instead of a um, Maryland. It helps you not to crush the node if possible. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move forward. Um, so this patient had a consult time of 328 minutes. The EBL was long higher than average. Um, she was um, managed on the EVAS gastric cancer protocol and discharged home on day five. She had no lymph nodes positive after the FLOT um, induction therapy and, and she had 46 lymph nodes um, retrieved. However, she came back with recurrence 32 months after this therapy and she's on a clinical trial. So I'm gonna move forward very quickly and I wanted to show you one last video about considerations for intraoperative difficulties. And so there are absolutely things that you need to consider when you're doing this operation. Margins of tumor may not always be apparent. So send a frozen section all the time. Difficulty of minimizing tumor manipulation when the tumor is very big. So try to uh, maintain a no touch technique by not directly grasping the stomach itself and the edges. And one of the most concerning things is the risk of hemorrhage. And I wanna show you a video of something that you can manage, but it is probably the biggest concern during an operation. So this is a um, middle-aged uh, male patient with a locally advanced gastric cancer that's undergoing a robotic gastrectomy. So I made the mistake of stapling off the left gastro gastric vein, uh, artery. And you'll notice here that it's being stapled and everything is going really well. Um, and I move on to finish the operation and do the resection. And some of you may have seen this video before because I have presented it in Korea, but you notice that the stapler is undone actually completely. And so it's a little bit harrowing, especially when your boss walks into the OR. Um, so to get out of this, again, I will never use a stapler across the left gastric, but um, we clipped it and stapled it. Uh, to show you real quickly. It's always nice to be prepared to open when you can. not So you should have an open tray available at all times, just in case. So luckily everything went well and completed the operation robotically. So we need to be set up for any possibility of robotic disasters. And we actually have a robotic disaster plan in our operating room. So in the interest of time, these are some of the um, complications that people experience, anastomic leak, abscess, stricture, probably the highest is the EJ stricture from our circular stapling, um, delayed incisional hernia, duodenal slump blowout, um, internal hernia, mortality none. And we are studying our patients in our ERAT pathway, um, and we will soon publish our data. So in conclusion, road to mastery of gast robotic gastrectomy is possible in the United States, but it takes quite a, a, a lot of commitment from, and a lot of effort. There are training tools soon to come out, our mastery um, of complex abdominal cancers for, to help the trainees. Um, you should train with pioneers and experts, many of whom are on this call. You should practice and improve on the simulator. And you can't say enough about in-person OR observations. You will never know what happens with that third arm if you are only watching the videos. And be at any as many bedside assists for robotics as possible, whether it's for, uh, for, for stomach cancer or for liver cancer or pancreatectomies, and then master the robot on the console. And in your free time, when you're out of the OR, partner with national and international partners on research to find a cure for cancer. Um, so one, one study is for advanced disease. The Stand Up to Cancer team is looking for early detection methods, um, non-invasive for gastric cancer and partnerships across borders and boundaries are welcome so we can find a cure for our patients. Thank you for your time.
so much, Yankee. I know we're running quite behind. So I'm oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's 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 fine. Um, so I want to hop right. Really great talk. Um, I just want to hop right into our last and final speaker. This is our international speaker. So we're very grateful to him. It's it's early in the morning for him in, in Korea. Dr. Woo Jin Young, who is from the Yonsei University in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, he is the director of gastric cancer at Yonsei Center and the chief of the division of gastroenterology gastrointestinal surgery. He's going to be talking to us about horizons for minimally invasive oncologic surgery, and we are so honored and happy to have you here. Dr. Young, please go ahead. Thank you, Vivian, and uh, I'd like to thank to uh, all the organizing committee members to make this happen, and uh, I'm a little bit worried about that in my side. <coughs> in Korea, we have some lags, so I, I hope my videos will play very well during my presentation. And these are my disclosures. And today I will cover these four uh, things, but uh, some of them was already covered by the previous speakers. So I will uh, try to, to be very fast in the initial several uh, presentations. Uh, in our country, Korea, we have done several clinical trials and we are learning several clinical trials also. And uh, it was also presented previously. And uh, as you can see here that the first clinical trial, class 01, uh, uh, we show that the, the better in early postoperative outcome, but uh, similar in survival. So in this study, we concluded that the laparoscopic surgery is comparable to open surgery with low morbidity. So we, in that, uh, study, we su suggested that our trial strongly supports the laparoscopic distal gastrectomy as a standard treatment option. And in year 2018, in Korean gastric cancer treatment guidelines that for clinical stage one distal gastric cancer, the standard treatment should be laparoscopic distal gastrectomy. And uh, let me introduce the, our second study, which was class 02, uh, quite recently published. But in this study, we were a little bit more cautious than class one trial. So we did very, very strict surgeon quality control before enroll the surgeons to the clinical trial. So we evaluate each surgeon's operative video and the, only the surgeons who were qualified by the uh, the peers who have huge experience in uh, gastrectomy can join the uh, clinical trial and they enroll the patient. So this study was published last year and uh, uh, two years ago, we published uh, uh, our short-term outcome result. And then again, we found that the better short-term outcome in terms of morbidity. So we found less morbidity in laparoscopy, which was mainly local complication, which means that the surgically, it might be better than uh, open surgery when it is done by the qualified surgeons. Here, uh, we did a surgeon qualification study. And uh, in the long term, there was no survival differences between the two groups. And we co concluded that the laparoscopic distal gastrectomy for locally advanced gastric cancer, if we perform the distal gastrectomy with D2 lymph node dissection, uh, provided the surgeons are highly skillful, the survival outcome will not be different between when we compared it with the open surgery. So in this study, we confirmed that uh, again, even for advanced gastric cancer, laparoscopic distal gastrectomy with D2 lymphadenectomy is comparable to open. And uh, it could be a potential standard treatment option for locally advanced distal gastric cancer. So maybe in very near future, our Korean guideline will change their strategy to recommending surgical types for locally advanced gastric cancer when it is done by uh, when it is did it for the distal gastrectomy, maybe the laparoscopic surgery will be the standard option. 
And quite similarly, uh, the Chinese colleagues published the same result that we have done for with our class zero two. And so far we were doing only for the distal gastrectomy studies. So in our country, we also did one another study to find out whether it is really feasible to perform total gastrectomy laparoscopically. And in this study, we found it was quite comparable to that of the historical control of the randomized study, which was done by uh, Western surgeons. So we were a little bit worried about that uh, it's generalizability because as all of the previous speakers said that uh, unlike to the Western patients, the, our Korean patients are relatively much thinner. That's why we were very happy to practice in, in our country. But uh, this is a little bit different story to that of uh, the stories uh, which is practicing in the States. However, we found that the, even the total gastrectomy was feasible technically, but the, for the oncological outcome, we started uh, another randomized clinical trial uh, named as class 06 for uh, total gastrectomy. So in this study, we also did a surgeon qualification. And uh, this study is a little bit different from that of previous one, which was that in this study, for the first time in our country, we did intraoperative randomization. Previously, we did the randomization before starting the operation. So there were some of the patients who refuses to receive the open surgery or something like that. However, in this study, uh, once the patients was uh, enrolled in the study, all the patients were uh, quite well operated uh, according to our uh, study protocol. And uh, But uh, the reason why we hired the intraoperative randomization strategy was that we experienced that some of the patients in class 02, they had uh, intraperitoneal metastasis uh, when we explored the patient. So this is the reason why we hired the intraoperative randomization. And so far we have enrolled about 300 patients. This number 273 was uh, by the end of uh, February. So uh, currently we have enrolled about uh, 300 some patients, but uh, the in recruitment is rather slow compared to the previous studies. The, the reason is that the, compared to the distal cancer, the proximal cancer incidence in our country is uh, relatively small. And uh, the surgeons are a little bit reluctant to perform very advanced uh, patients uh, by laparoscopically because it is quite technically demanding, even after the surgeon qualification. And regarding the lobotic surgery, we did uh, prospective non-randomized comparative study compared with lobotic and laparoscopic surgery quite a long time ago. And in this study, actually, it was not very positive, but uh, we only found that lobotic surgery cost much. Uh, but the, even the surgeons who have little experience can have the same result that of high experienced surgeons, uh, highly experienced surgeons uh, laparoscopic procedures. And regarding the survival outcome, this is our single institutional uh, analysis retrospective, but we found no survival differences between lobotic and laparoscopic. So mm. if it is uh, same, we may perform lobotic procedures uh, instead of laparoscopy when it is possible or feasible. So regarding the current evidence for lobotic surgery, there are not much proven benefit, although there are huge interest in, even in our country. But the gastrectomy with lobotic assistant may be, become more and more popular by the improvement of technology. There are more and more new technologies that are getting into the lobotic surgery system. So 
it may offer better operative environment to the surgeons. So maybe the surgeons may prefer to perform robotic surgery. And uh, it may make it possible for us to perform more sophisticated operation than laparoscopy in the future. So uh, I will cover a little bit of that in the later presentation. So far, the, the current evidence regarding the minimally invasive surgery for gastric cancer is that for early gastric cancer, minimally invasive surgery is the standard. And uh, for advanced gastric cancers, for distal gastrectomy, it is a standard. For total gastrectomy, it is technically feasible, but we need to wait for the result of class 06 trial. And the robotic application, it may be feasible and equivalent to laparoscopy, and it is very rapidly penetrated into the in the clinical practice in Korea. So, this is the uh, the experience of laparoscopic and robotic gastrectomy in our hospital. We are extremely high volume center, as you can see here. That our annual volume is almost one thousand, but among them, as you can see here, that from year two thousand nineteen. After we get the result of the class 02 trial, most of the patients are treated by minimally invasive. Very small number of patients are treated by open surgery. Uh, mostly they are patients who were enrolled in the clinical trial that may not allow the minimally invasive surgery or the, the clinical trials like class 06, we are performing open gastrectomy. So even with that, we do need some more uh, evidences for the wider application of the minimal invasive surgery for gastric cancer. Nowadays in Eastern Asia, especially in Korea and Japan, we are screening the patients uh, very enthusiastically. So the, in, in our country, we have nationwide screening program for gastric cancer biannual screening endoscopy for every citizens who are older than at the age of 40. So we have very small regions and the very early regions uh, detected by screening endoscopy. So in our hospital, more than 70% of our patients are stage one diseases. So we are much more interested in uh, function preservation. So our class group did function preservation surgery randomized clinical trial, which compared the pylorus preserving gastrectomy or the proximal gastrectomy with double track reconstruction. And uh, also we performed the clinical trial to val validate the, whether the sentinel node navigation concept is also feasible in gastric cancer. And also, as I mentioned before, that we do need the uh, evidence for oral gastrectomy for advanced gastric cancer. And relatively in Eastern Asia, we have a uh, relatively small number of EG junction cancer. Uh, mostly it is type three. So we do not have much incident, uh, high incidence in type one and two, especially type one cancer. Uh, in our hospital for last 15 years, we have only two patients. So it is quite uh, different from that of uh, Western countries. But uh, it is an uh, issue nowadays more and more because that uh, there is a uh, trend in proximal migration of the gastric cancer in, even in our country. And uh, another issue is that the, after the neoadjuvant therapy, whether applying minimal invasive surgery is feasible. So we uh, just prepared the, another clinical trial named CLAS08, which will compare the uh, neoadjuvant surgery uh, surgery after the neoadjuvant therapy uh, between laparoscopy and open. And regarding the stage four gastric cancer patient with multimodal treatment after the, uh, something like a convergent surgery, MIS would be feasible, will be an, another issue uh, in our country also. And then from now on that I'd like to talk about the, a little bit different story uh, from that of previous speakers, it's about adopting new technologies. 
So how we can use new technologies in the field of minimally invasive gastric surgery. So this is the uh, a kind of new tool for the better lymph node dissection and better lymph node examination. Uh, we hire the ICG as a lymphatic tracer and the, we inject the ICG around the tumor the day before by endoscopically. And uh, we are trying to, to use this neo-infrared imaging to detect the ICG stained lymphatics and lymph nodes. And uh, even after the dissection, we are retrieving the lymph nodes uh, from the specimen under the NIR imaging. By doing that, we were successful to retrieve more lymph nodes than conventional uh, surgery, like without uh, neo-infrared imaging. And it was very highly sensitive for tumor detection, metastatic lymph nodes. And it has very high negative predictive value, which means that if there is no fluorescent, the possibility of having lymph node metastasis would be very low. So this is the uh, a new technique for us to perform better lymph node surgery. And so this ICG fluorescent guided surgery helps us to identify all the draining lymph nodes from the primary region. And then it is a very good tool. As you can see here that you can see all the lymph nodes connected to the primary region is well visualized. And then you may notice that whether you can remove or you did remove all the lymph nodes that is uh, needed to be dissected. So it is a very good tool for us to assess the quality of lymph node dissection during the surgery. And also it is a very good tool for us to thoroughly examine the retrieved lymph nodes, uh, dissected lymph nodes after the surgery. And then it has very high accuracy and very low false negative rate for detecting metastatic lymph nodes. So it can be used not only for early gastric cancer. So this is quite different from that of the sentinel node uh, concept, but this is a tool for the better operative uh, quality. So if it is very, very too much specific and too much sensitive, we may change our formal lymph node dissection strategies to modify or uh, modification based on the lymphatic anatomy of each patient means that it can be an individualized lymph node dissection in the future. As you can see here that we can remove all the lymph nodes that was not uh, resected, which we could not identify without this kind of new technology. So this is a very good tool for us to perform uh, high quality lymph node dissection. And as you all know that the, the surgical technique has been changed from open to laparoscopy and robotic. And nowadays more and more new technologies are coming into the OR. So when you are looking at the past, so we were much more focusing on the mechanical development of the each instrument and the system. But now we are much more focusing on information or the, uh, the, the data-based treatment, even for surgery. So uh, I will try to, to explore, uh, explain some of the uh, approaches that we are doing here in Korea. So we are trying to, to make a uh, surgical rehearsal platform and planning. And also we are trying to, to use those images during the operation. And also at the same time, we are trying to, to analyze the gastrectomy videos to evaluate the operative performances and operative outcomes uh, which happened in the during, uh, during the operation. So we are using the CT scan images to make a 3D modeling virtually. And these images are used for the preoperative preparation. And as you can see here that this uh, pneumoperitoneum model is also make it possible for us to have the same operative 
images that is uh, with the virtual images. So when you are looking at these images, something like that, you may plan the throw up placement the day before, even before the operation, and you can perform that uh, during the surgery. And why this is important is something like this, that if you have a very good images of the virtual one, you can plan and you can identify all the anatomical structures that is necessary to be identified during the surgery. So something, this is the, we are, how we are trying to, to provide the similar operative environment. So we are making a predictive pneumoperitoneal model. So by making pneumoperitoneal model using deep learning uh, technology, we are trying to make it this possible. But as you can see here that if we uh, put the camera at port in just below the umbilicus, the camera location is depending on the how abdominal wall is displaced from the original insertion before making the pneumoperitoneum. So the images that we are trying to, to use during the surgery might not be different from the actual operation. So it is really important once we have a very good uh, pneumoperitoneum model. So when you are looking at this, that if the camera is located here, you may not see the actual images that you can get during the operation. But when you move it, the actual operative image and the virtual image will be the same. So like this, you may see that how we can register those two different images into one, like this, that you may see that perfect registration of those images. So this makes, possible for us to perform more advanced uh, operations. This is the inclusion of our operative uh, navigation software with the intraoperative uh, the fluorescent navigation. So we are using the fluorescent imaging during the surgery and all at the same time we are using the vascular images of the patient. And you can see here that in this patient, the accessory right colic and gastrocolic uh, the light gastroepiploic vein is separately drains to the superior mesenteric vein. And uh, at the same time, we are trying to, to identify the lymphatic drainage pattern. And also this is a very good tool for us to delineate the mesocolon and the mesogastrium. And you may see that this uh, is the, the, the lowermost uh, anterior superior pancreatic duodenal vein, and you can see that these two veins are separately drained to the superior mesenteric vein, like this. So you may notice that how you can approach these vessels during the surgery, because this is the same operative view you may have. And then you can confirm that whether there is a, uh, how you can approach this uh, head of the pancreas area more efficiently by watching the blood vessels that is needed to be ligated like this. And then we are trying to, to identify the light gastric, art gastric plug artery. And then you may see that there is a light gastric plug artery and there is an infrapyloric artery just behind it. So now we are trying to, to identify light gastric plug artery and behind there, there's an intrapyloric artery. So we, after we ligate this light gastric fluid artery, we will approach to this intrapyloric artery. So we, again, we ligate this intrapyloric artery. So all the vascular structures that is needed for the lymph node dissection during the gastrectomy is can be very easily identified. And you can see here that light gastric artery is coming from gastroduodenal artery just after the bifurcation. So you may see this is the light gastric artery from just below the bifurcation. And you can see that the portal vein drains 
uh, the left gastric vein drains to the portal vein. And you may see that behind the common hepatic artery. Here, this is the com common hepatic artery. Behind it, there is a portal vein. And we are trying to, to identify the root of the left gastric artery from the bifurcation of the common hepatic artery and the splenic artery. Here you can identify those. And then you can see that there is a splenic vessel, splenic artery is quite tortuous. So you may see that tortuous splenic artery is exposed there. And uh, here you can see that the splenic vein just behind the, below the splenic artery, which you may see splenic vein is there. And then after that, after the whole lymph node dissection, you may confirm the resection line based on the near infrared imaging too. And then another very good technology uh, deep learning enabled us is that we can find out the what's happening even uh, by reviewing the surgical videos. This is the uh, our first trial for the operation recognition during the operation. Uh, at, using the surgical video. So you may see that we can identify which portion and then even the operative events like the bleeding is happened here. And then each instrument movement can be identified through using this. We can have a kind of operation reports based on the uh, deep learning technology, using deep learning technology, we may automatically analyze the each operation, like how many events were happens during the each step of operation. And this operative, the events can be related to the each uh, step of uh, procedure. So this one can be reported, not just single operation, their serial operation can it can be reported to the surgeons. So this is a very good feedback. Even the surgeons who did surgery just before, they may have this kind of lipos. And uh, they can, this is a kind of uh, self-education tool and self-confirmation tool for their surgical quality. So this kind of new technologies will provide us to perform easier operation than before. So the surgeons could have better operative environment. And those uh, ideas can be come from many needs from the surgeons who are currently practicing. And the, so the minimal invasive surgery for gastric cancer soon will become the mainstream modality and will be the standard treatment. And uh, also at the same time, it will incorporate a lot of imaging technologies and data analytics in the future. And thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'd like to, to appreciate all the colleagues that I have been working with. And thank you very much. And everybody is welcome to Korea. And whenever you are coming to Korea, please drop by to our hospital. This is our hospital images. Well, Wujin, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Huang, as, as always, your, your presentations are just fabulous. Um, I'd like to invite all the speakers uh, to, to come back on lives. And I know that we're almost at the end at nine o'clock, but since we did not have a chance to ask questions and have some discussion, I thought we would just run over by about 10 minutes for those of you who can, who can stay on uh, so that we can just get a little bit of um, a little discussion going. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Young, I'd like to ask you, with all this incredible technology, I mean, it, it just goes to show how much we all have to learn from one another uh, in terms of the technological advances and, and how you can apply those. Um, just incredible work. What do you think is the main way that you're going to be using this technology? The first, Because the first thing that comes to my mind is how this could be used as a improved teaching tool. Uh, for your for your fellows, you know, you can show them the anatomy, the lymph nodes in, in a way that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise, even with the dual console. What what is your opinion on that, and, and how this is going to move forward? The, yeah, I totally agree with your idea. It's a very good tool for the education, but even at the same time, you know that the images that I showed you during my presentation is that 
regarding the lymph nodes and lymphatics. Previously, we couldn't see that yeah. during the operation, even with very high resolution images. And the anatomical structures, like the, the very small, tiny vessels, if it is the patients like your country, very obvious cases, you may not notice the, where the exact location of the vessel is, but uh, it may help us to give all the anatomical knowledge to the surgeons regardless of their experiences and regardless of their patient uh, condition. So it is not just only for the surgical education, but it will help for every surgeon to perform easier operation than before. Yeah, I mean, the, for the safety of our patients and the morbidly obese, I, I can imagine how this could be so useful in our practice. Uh, Naru, what do you think about that? Dr. Ikoma? Yeah, I completely agree. You know, the, doing the minimal invasive and robotic gastrectomy for patients, you know, skinny, young, and healthy, you know, Japanese, Korean uh, patients, it's a totally different story when we are performing gastrectomy for you know, BMI 45 in the United States, for example, like Dr. Kams, you know, mentioned that 70% of our patient's population uh, is supposed to be obese. And then, uh, yeah, the, having those technology to guide us, those details in anatomy will, will be a critical uh, to help uh, and ease the, the complexity of the operation. Yeah, absolutely. And as soon as we're open yeah. and can come over to Korea, we, we'll come visit. <laughs> yeah, please. John, John absolutely. I just wanted to uh, congratulate all the presenters for really a phenomenal uh, presentations. Uh, really, it's opening the box in the mind of the surgical community as to what can and should be done. And we appreciate all your time. You know, in the, in the interest of time, I just wanted to circle back to Bill and, and ask, uh, when you look at the molecular blood markers that you're talking about, they're very exciting and the possibilities run endless in one's mind. At this point, do you think these are going to be things that are used in terms of surveillance of the cancer status of the patient, detection of a cancer, or helping to direct us in terms of who needs uh, adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy moving forward? Yeah, good question, John. I think the, the first use will be in the, an adjunct to screening. So it won't, they won't replace existing screens. They, those will stay, but, but being able to identify people uh, at earlier stages in the disparities, as I mentioned. Going forward, there may be uh, prognostic markers, certainly in the in within the circulating tumor DNA. Obviously, if you, if you have an active tumor, you'd expect to detect it. And if, if it's gone, you would expect not to. I think that's a, the, sort of the next question as these, get, uh, as these evolve, how useful that will be um, in the recurrence and also um, uh, and in predicting recurrence. And I think it, there is a lot more validation to do of the sensitivity of these tests. So if it only picks up a recurrence when you have 10 liver metastases, that's not very useful. But if you get very early and you can, can uh, use chemo or whatever, that would be, be good. So I think we were early days, even though they will be approved soon for as a regular test, not a FDA approval, but as an available test, uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of things to watch for. Yeah, and, and just to, to take off on John's question, I mean, I was also fascinated by your talk in terms of how you discuss GI cancers in general, all GI cancers that are increasing in incidence so significantly, especially in the US. What, how do you, what do you hypothesize that's uh, attributed to? Do you think it's environmental? Do you think it's you know, the obesity problem? What, what do you think is driving all of this? It's a great question. One we honestly don't know, particularly the earlier onset. I mean, we're, we're yeah. seeing all these, these cancers that are the early, that are being diagnosed at an earlier age. So clearly obesity is one of those, those factors. But I, I don't think we can just say, yeah, it's just obesity. American patients are obese. That's that. That's certainly one factor. But with the birth cohorts, uh, you, you wonder it, it with, with the, the shift toward processed food, toward antibiotics, toward changes in the gut microbiome. I mean, uh, it, there's some of the gastric uh, 
uh, increase has been hypothesized for gastric dysbiosis. I mean, not, not just H. pylori, but rather what, what has changed in that flora. So lots of things to explore in, in the research field. I, I wish I could be more definitive. I mean, that's an area yeah. of intense research. Yeah, it would be wonderful because obviously the sooner we can detect this or if we can even prevent, you know, these cancers, that would be wonderful. Uh, uh, Wujin, are you seeing similar things in, in similar trends in Korea with gastric cancer or not really? Actually, you know that uh, if you think about very specific Korean situation, you know that receiving endoscopy is only about how much is it? Uh, for one single upper endoscopy is less than $15. <laughs> so, so screening is yeah. yeah you can certainly screen more uh, easily but are you seeing the increased trends in younger gastric cancers in korea also are you seeing uh, that right? yeah actually you know that nowadays it's totally uh difficult for us to uh finding out those things because that we have very strong nationwide screening system from the, at the age of 40 so we have very few patients who are under at the age of 40, but most of the younger patients are coming to the office with far advanced stages, except for some patients with some symptoms like active bleeding from the ulcer or something. Yeah. I see, I see. Um, Naru, do you, did you have any questions for or at any of our panelists? Um, I, ha I have a few other questions, but... Want to give you a yeah, I do have many. I do have many, and I, I hope we we have an, an, another hour to ask questions. So <laughs> the one particular question I really want to ask is about the education, and more and more trainees are seeking for seeking for the opportunity to learn robotic and minimal invasive approach for the gastric cancer, and their expectation is you know continue to rising. And when they come to the Silicon Oncology Fellowship, you know they they already had uh, you know quite a good experience of the robotic surgery in general surgery training and they want to learn more complex operation like gastrectomy or pancreatectomy for cancer operations but those are uh, you know technically demanding and it requires higher level of anatomy understanding and the ra uh, rationale for the oncology surgery so I really want to ask you know all panelists if you could share uh, about your approach to optimizing, you know, the fellows or residents, you know, opportunity to learn those robotic surgery skills. And if there are any, you know, curriculum or prerequisite for fellows to, you know, the start operation uh, in the robotic surgery on the actual patients. Yeah, Yang He, why don't you start with that? Yeah, I mean, this is such a huge topic. We can spend an entire day yeah. talking about this. Right. So at City of Hope, there is, you know, we have three fellows each year, Sir John Fellows, and you're absolutely right, your observation about them wanting to do more uh, minimally invasive uh, robotic cases. So the encouraging part is, you know, whatever structure program that you develop to, for them, what's happening is that they're actually going out and successfully performing these oncologically sound operations using the robot. Uh, and it's preferred now. We've surveyed our fellows that left here and, and they text me and say, hey, Dr. Wu, I did a robotic gastrectomy. I, and then my answer is send me the video, <laughs> right? Because you want to make sure that the approach that is being used, whatever they practiced here. And so I think it is upon us, our onus is upon us to teach them the right way. Right, they need to get on the console. They need to go to take the courses. So whatever it takes to get them as facile, if they're gonna use minimally invasive surgery for complex cancer operations, and it's gonna be, they're gonna choose, they most likely are gonna choose something that's easier to adopt, then it is it is imperative that we train them properly. And that's something that we need, probably should discuss, you know, amongst all the leaderships right here. So it would be really nice to get um, a curriculum together that's across all disciplines to get yeah. them access. Naru, how are you handling it, MD Anderson? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, to be honest, I'm, uh, it is a challenge uh, to, you know, I'm going through the learning curve my, my, for myself and then uh, to teach, you know, fellows to do those, those complex robotic operation is, is challenging, but the short answer is I'm doing my best. And so uh, it is at this point, uh, it's quite individualized based on the fellows, you know, experience in the, the previous training 
and their enthusiasm and, and uh, how much they prepare uh, before coming to the operation room. And then, uh, then uh, I found that it is uh, it is helpful to uh, to give them what is the expectation in the operation. So I divide it into you know different steps uh, for each operation for the gastrectomy. You know, lymph node number six, five, eight. You know, uh, those. You know, there's the steps for each operation for gastrectomy and pancreatectomy. And then I share the video in advance. I I do have a you know the the, the Dropbox folder, and then the fellow can review those videos in advance. And then we discuss it before the surgery. And uh, I want to learn this step for today's operation, for example. And having those expectations allow fellows to prepare more. And I found that their, you know, satisfaction level is higher if I'm transparent about the uh, expectation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is such a, such an ex excellent point because teaching minimally invasive techniques is is a challenge. You know, John, mm -hmm. who, who does this for colorectal, will knows it as well. It's it's a challenge to teach it. But I think Wuja, Dr. Young had shown some nice data, really showing how the robotic approach shortens that learning curve. And I, I really believe that's true. Um, teaching mm -hmm. laparoscopic gastrectomy, which is what I used to do from like 2005, for, you know, for a number of years, um, it was a, a tremendous challenge, almost, uh, you know, <laughs> very challenging. But with the robot and having the dual console, I think the opportunity to teach, and, and I agree with you, Dr. Yakoma, teaching stepwise and having, having various steps that uh, once the fellows can demonstrate proficiency in one of the simpler steps, then you move on and you have some progression. I think that's that's a really helpful, good approach because yeah, everyone in, in, in these training programs, in our large training programs, they, they want to learn this and, and they need to learn it in a sequential way. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what Dr. Dada thinks. He's now on the other side. <laughs> um, and uh, and how, how do you feel teaching all of this now? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I agree with everything that's been said and, and, and part of the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the challenge of transitioning to uh, early attendingship, as uh, Dr. Ikomo mentioned, you know, are, are multifold. Um, I, I think I, I want to go back to talking about infrastructure, as I mentioned in my talk. I think the infrastructure is also really important not just, you know, direct education of fellows or graded responsibility and things like that. I think just simple things like having a surgical technologist at the bedside um, that is uh, skilled in la uh, robotic surgery, exchanging instruments so that your fellow can sit on the dual console. And, uh, you know, we take that as, as a given, and, but it's not always a, a given. And I think that having that infrastructure is really critical. Uh, and, and so the investment on the part of the institution um, and, and as part of the fellowship, I think is really critical as well. And we're lucky to have that, as I showed you, some pictures of, and I'm sure all the institutions here um, have that. But I think that's another piece of that that I think is very critical. There is one trick that is helpful in low volume complex cases. And I think the studies have borne this out. If because the urologists and gynecologists have used the robot so much and they do it routinely and sometimes feel much more comfortable having the fellows do some of these cases, um, it's the studies have shown that if you perform more, not just procedure specific, um, but robotic cases that you are, you become more likely to adopt the technology. So what we have gotten from our um, gynocs and um, urologists is to have our fellows, DSO fellows, be part of their, you know, when they do these robotic cases and they are there, um, got a commitment from them like five years ago, and now we're, you know, part of all of that. So it does help them feel a lot more comfortable in the operating room on the console. So it's good and it's much easier. Yeah, if you're at the bedside, you feel much better, more comfortable when you let the fellow on this console, when the fellow knows a little bit how to use the robot, <laughs> and when you don't always have a dual console in your room. I think the that, uh, I think this content. conversation has really highlighted the impetus for this whole webinar program, which is to improve the performance and the facility of us doing oncologic surgery, MIS. I think, you know, I'm fond of the saying that a fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> and so, you know, the robot, a laparoscope or open, you have to, I think it's important for us as the leaders in our fields to impress upon the audience. The goal has to be to do the operation as perfectly as you can do it in your hands. And so it's great if you can do that robotically or laparoscopically, but it has to be the best for the patient on the table that day. And as has been said in every field of oncologic surgery, there is a progression of complexity of the steps. And if you break the steps into a segmental process and you start with the easier steps and you can advance. And likewise, as the audience is learning, you can break things into partial aspects so that you can do part of the operation robotically and part of the operation open so that you become serially better at the operations so that you can in the end do it perfectly for your patient. And so I'd like to thank everyone for sharing so generously your knowledge, which is obviously extensive with the audience. And with that, I'll turn it back to Vivian to uh, conclude. Yeah, no, I, I uh, echo everything that John has said, and thank you so much. Obviously, our discussion could go on for another hour or two, uh, but uh, you know we're, we're running behind here, and, and I'm sure everyone wants to call, call it a night. So I cannot thank all of our speakers enough, uh, my co-hosts also, for, uh, for making this such a really interesting evening. I learned a lot. I hope our panelists did, uh, and, and uh, we see a few questions that are in the Q&A we will try and get back to all of you about uh, the, the questions that you've asked. And I hope all of you have a good night. Join us for the future webinars. It's going to be every month. Uh, you'll see the, the announcements for it and hope that we can see you at those as well. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much. Everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.